Good morning and welcome to the 14th All Energy and Decarbonise webinar. It's a milestone event for it marks our inaugural double session with this morning's Smart Sustainable Cities, Learnings from Sharing Cities project being part one, followed this afternoon by something of an overlap of talent by Business Case for Smart Sustainable Cities Solutions, No More Pilots coupled with a call to action. I'm Judith Patton, project director of our duo shows and the co-creator of All Energy way back at the start of the century. Whilst I talk briefly, my slides will help you get the greatest benefit during your time with us today and afterwards. What is important is that if you would like to ask questions or rate this webinar, that you shrink your screen from full screen to be able to see where to do both things. Partnership is very much at the core of today's events. We're delighted that we're holding them in partnership with Microsoft and thank James Lockyer, who you'll be hearing from later, for being so inspirational in inviting some of Microsoft's invaluable partners to join us as panelists. Welcome, gentlemen. I hope you'll forgive me if I make a special mention of two very good friends of All Energy and Decarbonise who are also taking part. First, our chair for today, Claire Foster, a partner and head of clean energy at Shepherd and Wedderburn. She is a project finance specialist who leads the organisation's team on most clean energy transactions and a commissioner on the Edinburgh Climate Commission. Claire has chaired our Smart and Sustainable Cities sessions at All Energy for five years. We couldn't hold them without her. So it's great to have her hand on the tiller of today's duo of webinars. I'd like to thank Councillor Anna Richardson, City Convener for Sustainability and Carbon Reduction of Glasgow City Council, whose passion for her topic is infectious. Indeed, it should be bottled and sold. Without any more ado, can I wish you all a stimulating 90 minutes and hand over to Claire Foster. Judith, good morning and thank you very much for the kind introduction. Good morning to everyone who's here and I hope you're all keeping safe and well. Good morning everyone and a very warm welcome to this morning's session on learnings from the Sharing Cities project. As Judith said, my name's Claire Foster and I'm a partner at law firm Shepherd and Wedderburn. I have the pleasure of being your chairperson this morning and I'm in the unique position of having chaired the Sustainable Cities plenary session on day one of the All Energy Conference every year since 2015. And yet in that time, we have not solved the issue of sustainability for our cities across the UK. Now, I'm hoping that's not a reflection on my chairing skills, but rather indicative of the complexities of achieving a deliverable, sustainable decarbonisation strategy that works for the 32 local authorities across Scotland, the 343 local authorities in England, 22 in Wales, and the 11 local government districts in Northern Ireland. And so if I can take a moment to set the scene for this morning. For those following the ongoing climate emergency narrative, and it's hard not to, there are two key dates most frequently discussed in the UK context. They are 2050, being the date passed into law by UK government as the target for achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions. And 2045, the equivalent Scottish date, which incidentally is the most ambitious national target declared to date globally. Now, both dates follow on from the recommendations set out by the Climate Change Committee, being the government's independent advisory body. And the committee published its report, which I'm sure a number of you have read, entitled Net Zero, the UK's Contribution to Stopping Global Warming. That was published in May 2019. And the UK and Scottish parliaments enacted the 2050 and 2045 dates shortly thereafter. In the Scottish context, Two of our major cities, Edinburgh and Glasgow, also each declared a climate emergency in May 2019 and have each set a target of 2030, with Edinburgh looking to reach net zero by that date and Glasgow aiming for carbon neutrality by that date. So there are lots of target dates and some grand ambitions, but what does it mean in practical terms for cities? 
The statistics in the Net Zero report make for sobering reading and the challenges are enormous. And remember that all of the target dates I mentioned were set before COVID-19 reared its head earlier this year and had a devastating effect on our lives and the economy. While there are pockets of best practice in a number of cities, there doesn't appear to be a uniform approach on how projects are scoped, structured, funded and executed. A myriad of smaller CapEx projects is being undertaken, though frustratingly the vast majority to date have been small in value and size. And larger scale whole of city projects are few and far between, despite the obvious demonstrable benefits. If we have any hope of achieving sustainability from a city perspective, then collaboration is going to be crucial. Crucial in terms of trying to get things back on track economically and sustainably, particularly now when quite frankly, the economy is in free fall. What happens next has to be in the interest of achieving economic recovery but also has to be sustainable and improve the lives of people who live in our cities. We've all heard the term green recovery, but how do we get there and to what extent can technology and data facilitate that transition? Collaboration can lead to scale and aggregation. That would lead to more interest from developers, investors, funders, and more capital flowing into cities to expand, regenerate, modernize, and critically create jobs. Larger projects could provide greater flexibility to incorporate innovations in technology and the potential for synergies from multi-sector whole of city projects is gigantic. Think local authority, healthcare, energy, justice, transport, waste and water all working together. In pursuing a dynamic relationship between public and private sector, which between them has the expertise, the means and the determination to see these projects through to fruition, we will see a step change. And why reinvent the wheel each time if there's evidence of success, which can be replicated and scaled? So this morning, we're going to explore what can be gleaned and shared from projects that are already underway and which foster collaboration. For a number of the panel, the focus will be on discussing the key advantages and benefits of the Sharing Cities project. And we'll also hear how data can play a crucial role in the successful sustainable city and about progress made locally and how data and smart solutions are already being deployed. Now this brings me to the panel sitting patiently waiting to speak. I'm going to give very brief intros for each of our panel members as I know you've got access to the biographies online and I'll leave you to read those more fully at your leisure. So firstly, may I introduce James Lockyer. James has worked in the software industry for over 20 years and has spent the last 15 at Microsoft. He's currently responsible for leading industry-focused IoT sales and marketing efforts in the EMEA region and has a passion for smart cities and places as well as energy verticals. Jason Warwick is a highly experienced smart city technology leader and strategist and CTO for Urban Integrated UK. Jason has deep experience in technology transformation in government and cities with technical expertise in smart city, M2M and IoT technologies. Next up is Bill Wilson. Bill leads on IoT and smart cities for Kanos and has most recently been working with Microsoft and the Greater London Authority on open data initiatives. By profession, Bill is an enterprise data architect. As Judith mentioned, I'm also delighted to welcome Councillor Anna Richardson. Anna was elected as Councillor in Langside, which is in Glasgow in 2015 and re-elected in 2017. And she currently holds the position of City Convener for Sustainability and Carbon Reduction. And unlike some of the other panels, what she's going to do is give an overview of some of the projects that are actually happening in Glasgow, which are utilising smart solutions and data-driven approaches. Last up, but by no means least, is Gary Bennett. Gary is a strategic thought leader who joined Urba Schrader in November 2018 as MD responsible for developing and executing the evolution of external LED lighting to a citywide digital lighting platform. Now, with such a plethora of talent, I'm sure we'll be offered some unique insights and ideas on how to tackle the particular challenges facing cities and how best to move the dial on decarbonisation and sustainability using data and technology to its best advantage. I've asked each of the speakers to give a short presentation with their preliminary thoughts. A gentle request and reminder that each panel should stick to time and the plan then is going to launch 
is to launch into our Q&A session where I challenge you, our audience, to ask some questions to get the debate going and really see if we can tackle some of these challenges. Now, I'm not proposing to speak in between presentations in the interest of keeping things moving and to allow our panelists the maximum time to articulate their ideas and thoughts and so that we can get to the Q&A session more quickly. So if I may now hand over to James Lockyer of Microsoft to kick off proceedings. James. Thank you, everybody, and good morning. Um, thanks, Claire, for running through the background and also Judith for and team for helping to set up today. Um, really looking forward to, uh, to to the to the next few minutes and, and for the wider discussion with the team and, and, and really appreciate everybody making the time to, to, to join the session today. Um, uh, as Claire mentioned, I, I work within within the Microsoft uh, organization. Um, I specifically work within our Internet of Things business. Uh, we work with organizations to help them leverage the Internet of Things and the resulting data that is collected to really see what is happening in specific scenarios that they are focused on, to understand causes and impacts, um, to predict what will happen, and to really take action with, with real-time data-driven responses. Um, I'm just paranoid I'm on mute, so I'm just going to double check I am all good, and then we will carry on. Good, I can see I'm still on mute, sorry, just wanted to double check that. Um, so from an agenda perspective today, um, over the next few minutes, we shall share some of the insights um, that we've gained from a number of briefings with senior local and regional government leaders, um, and also highlight how Microsoft and our rich partner ecosystem are enabling them to move forward with their smart city strategies. So when we think about the discussions that we've had with leaders in, in the London boroughs and, and city councils across the UK, we're hearing a number of common themes. Um, you can see from this from this uh, word word chart here that really some of those standout standout topics such as streetlights, um, city data lakes, smart parking, uh, traffic flow, smart cameras. Um, the list is consistent across the conversations that we are having, um, and I think what this represents for us is a is a number of opportunities as an organisation and with our partners to think about how we can best support that dialogue and really enable those those strategies to come to life. As we look at um, more specifically around sharing cities, which, which is where Jason will, will jump in in a few minutes to really provide much more detail on the sharing cities initiative. Um, what we can see there is, is that the, the sharing cities uh, um, motion really focuses on three core areas around people, place and platform. And if we think about what, what, what that means from a people perspective, that's really about leveraging user centric services with the citizen at the center. Um, perhaps leveraging smart city solutions to reduce citizens' energy use and bills, or maybe even improving the health of citizens through not only monitoring air quality by sensors perhaps embedded on smart lampposts, um, but encouraging a shift to a low-carbon shared mobility set of solutions like e-bikes or e-car sharing or, or even EV charging points or smart parking. Um, it's, exci it's exciting to think about what effects IoT can have on residents' everyday experiences um, and with the examples already covered in terms of things like street lamps telling, telling residents how clean the air is or having the ability to report if streets are dirty or, or notify if there are problems on the road uh, or even bins telling local authorities when they're full. If we think about places, um, we really think about infrastructure solutions to promote low energy usage. And we'll cover those in more detail in the session that we're running this afternoon at, at 2 p.m. But from a, from a platform perspective, the urban sharing platform or urban data platform or urban data ecosystem, it has, it has a number of different terms for, for, for a similar concept. But essentially, we're talking about taking data from several sources and providing functions and services that help to enable a smart city. So, for example, imagine taking data from a, a wide variety of different devices and sensors, such as electric vehicles and, and bikes and, and smart lampposts, energy efficient buildings, uh, and being able to store, process and correlate that data and present that information back to the city and the citizens so as to enable a better use of the city and its resources. These concepts are essentially uh, solutions that are leveraging the Internet of Things and cloud-based data platforms. So when we think about um, 
uh, the Internet of Things. And if we really peel that back, it's about collecting data, insights and actions which we can take uh, action on. Um, if we make that more of a, of a real world example, um, we could potentially think about smart connected streetlights that have air quality sensors um, installed on them. Uh, we could be able to track that air pollution data, um, which could enable um, decisions and, and inform decisions around, around areas such as urban planning. But fundamentally, we're talking about data being collected by smart sensors, that data then going into um, cloud-based platforms, um, which is where you can then apply some of those uh, different cloud services such as machine learning or artificial intelligence, and then obviously take insights from that, as I said. And there's a, there is then that awesome power to then think about, okay, what are those proactive recommendations, actions we need to take to really improve the, not only the, the ebb and flow of the city, but the lives of citizens as well. Oops, sorry, next slide, yeah, wrong way. Um, we also are talking about um, smart and sustainable cities. Um, and we, within Microsoft, we, we look at sustainability specifically in, in four main areas across energy management, water management, carbon, and waste management. Um, I thought it would be interesting to very quickly just cover one scenario, which is building energy management. And we'll go into more detail on that in this afternoon session where we'll have Iconics joining us. Um, but if you think about why, um, why building energy management, um, we know that, uh, that, that research has shown that buildings contribute to 40% of energy consumption worldwide. And this, of course, has a direct impact on increasing carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, naturally, there are cost savings as well, um, as a result of leveraging smart building technologies. Um, we also know that through our partners that smart building, uh, smart, we also know through our partners that smart buildings help to reduce energy consumption by up to 20%. Um, in addition to that, we know through our own experience uh, where we've implemented the iconic solution um, uh, on our own campus in the US in, in Redmond, that we're able to save around 25% in terms of um, uh, energy consumption. Um, this is all achieved through leveraging our Azure Cloud Platform and the Azure IoT and analytics and artificial intelligence um, that, that our cloud platforms enable us to. So when you think about really uh, how and where IoT or Internet of Things solutions are helping us to evolve from what we see as today and, and perhaps a little bit historically now is connected assets to really moving into connected environments and connected ecosystems. But essentially data, analytics, AI and those cognitive services are really helping us to enable that transition. And with that, I will, I will stop there and, and thank you for, for your time. And then I shall hand over to Jason. Thank you, everybody. Hello, I'm trying to share my screen, which isn't quite working at the moment. Ah, here we go. Okay, first time for this. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, James, for the introduction. Also, a very good overview of what a smart city uh, and a data platform does and the value of it. Um, the Sharing Cities project that I'm going to make you talk about this morning is a large-scale project funded by the EU H2020 program. Um, it's five year, 25 million euros that span three primary countries and cities, that being London, Lisbon, and Milan, with follower cities or fellow cities, Warsaw, Burgas, and Bordeaux, whose role it was to adopt some of the measures that were proven by the core cities. So in the course of the sharing cities journey, we um, covered, I think, many of the, of the quite common smart city solutions and projects that are starting to, to gain ground and volume worldwide. So smart lighting um, is one, electric vehicles, um, energy efficiency and retrofit in, into buildings, um, e-bikes, and, and my personal favorite, which is the smart data platform, or as we call it in um, sharing cities, the urban sharing platform. And so we, <clears throat> what we focused on in terms of 
um, the objectives and the of the project. Um, sorry, having some slight technical difficulties. Ah, here we go. Um, so objectives were really to, to, to prove the, the key measures and also to demonstrate economies of scale. So when these measures are shared um, across the cities in terms of procurement, creating templates and designs for other cities to follow, the focus of those measures was is sustainability. And you know the intention is to to really to unlock the market and prove that these measures can be um, can be utilized at scale and easily adopted by cities. So some of the key um, outputs that, that we achieved in terms of um, the three core cities, um, a big increase in electromobility, both from bikes and EVs and shared EVs, um, with a big impact on, on um, emissions. Um, in the UK, in Greenwich, um, the first UK water source heat pump. Um, another good UK example is the London Data Store, which um, expanded on existing open data um, sharing model to include some smart city data, uh, which was more sensitive by nature and therefore had to um, focus a little bit on secure access. Um, the latest iteration there, you can now see um, EV charging points across London through the, through the data store. Um, during the course of the project, DDPR became, I guess, live and into force. That created some quite interesting challenges around data security um, and use of data uh, and some excellent learning um, from the project in relation to GDPR. I'm not sorry, one too many. Um, but really, the, the key to sharing is, is to share um, our learning. There are two key tools that we've created um, to share those learnings. The smart booklets is the first one. And the smart booklet is a, a short to summary of each of the key measures um, from the sharing Cities project. So there's a list here on the right from building retrofit, citizen engagement, um, through to smart lab posts and e-mobility. You can find the playbooks um, on the web link there on the Sharing Cities site. And that provides um, both a description of the, the projects in each of the three cities, um, some of the learnings from the projects and some indications of the, of the cost and what it would take to replicate um, each of those measures in to another city. Um, the next set of tools um, are the smart city playbooks. These are much more detailed manual in terms of um, how another city would um, both plan and scope and adopt, um, again, some of the key measures. To date, we don't have a, um, a playbook for every measure. Um, the project is still running. And you know, by the end of this year, there will be another playbook on smart infrastructure, which combines um, IoT and the urban sharing platform. Um, the second set of slides, which I've got here, um, just a very high level sort of set of principles and approach that, you know, taking from the learning to sharing cities, I think is useful guidance for, for other cities that are interested in, in studying and scoping um, a smart city project. And apologies for the uh, slightly different view of um, PowerPoint here. Um, so some starting principles about you know doing things we call it the right way, um, but in a bit more detail, you know being outcome led, um, really considering the needs of, of the users and the city, um, and to have a very clear vision is I think very important. Often there's emphasis overemphasis on technology, 
Uh, it's a very important part of, of finding an overall solution to a city's problem, but it's not the, not the only key challenge. Um, what we call the right way, um, the design approach is, is key to this, about collaboration, engaging citizens, um, transparency around the way in which decisions are made and responsibility. And again, I mentioned it earlier, but privacy, GDPR, um, are very important, in, particularly in these times. The technology is, is still important. Um, I think, you know, the use of open standards and open systems is, um, is very important. Looking carefully at choices between um, open source and procure software, the challenge um, the difference between the two is often not as open as it seems. And again, resilience and safety um, are two very important aspects. And <clears throat> that's really the end of uh, my slides. Thank you. Sorry, I've completely forgotten who I'm handing over to now, who's next on the list. I think it might be Bill. Bill, hello. Yeah, hello, Jason. I, I forget the name. Right. Um, so, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good to be speaking to you this morning. Um, I guess um, uh, but my background is in uh, data and analytics, as Claire mentioned earlier. And uh, uh, actually, although Jason didn't recall all of it, we were having a conversation uh, last week about how um, urban data sharing um, platforms, uh, how they might get a greater adoption across cities worldwide and whether uh, the COVID-19 crisis or the climate emergency might be the catalyst that drives um, some of that adoption. Well, I thought I'd talk this morning about the importance of data in tackling the climate crisis. Um, now, uh, uh, Claire's already talked about uh, kind of net zero and some of the ambitions in Scotland. Some of you may have seen that even China now has uh, declared a, a net zero date of 2060. Now, of course, the reality is um, through various factors that the corporate world uh, has done a lot of the running on this uh, date. Not least our partners today, Microsoft, and the scale of their ambition is impressive. So I started trying to measure the carbon footprint of the company I work for, Kanos, uh, and we, I had to gather quite a lot of different data sets around procurement, um, employee commuting. Uh, I now know a lot more about kerosene boilers than I ever thought I would. Um, but uh, the, the point is that uh, in, the, in the corporate sector, you can't kind of fudge it because there are uh, standards like uh, the Carbon Disclosure Project and the Science-Based Target Initiatives. Uh, these standards uh, require you to uh, get a, a handle on what your carbon footprint is and then what measures you're going to take and how you're going to track those with KPIs as you progress towards decarbonisation as a company. So I was thinking to myself, how do we apply this to cities and their decarbonisation ambitions? Uh, I don't pretend to be uh, an expert, uh, but as a practitioner in this field, I've noticed five things I'd like to share with you this morning. Uh, the first is that this is an urgent problem. Uh, probably that goes without saying, um, given that this webinar is delivered in uh, association with Decarbonize. Now, um, Greta Thunberg has not been in the headlines recently, but I was uh, struck by something she said to US citizens. Um, I know you're trying, US senator, sorry, I know you're trying, but just not hard enough. Um, and that kind of sentiment struck me and has kind of drawn me further into this kind of work. Now, the second point is that it's important to uh, baseline and track emission status, first of all, so we can see whether we're making an impact on the overall problem and also determine which initiatives are being successful. I noticed uh, a couple of weeks ago, Dundee City Council announced that they had adopted the Climate View platform now uh, to, to kind of measure, uh, try and measure the carbon footprint and so on. Uh, now, uh, Climate View is almost uh, more interesting for their methodology than their platform. Uh, they're interested in tracking uh, behavior change. Um, so, for example, it's much easier to uh, measure the rate of change in electric vehicle adoption across the city than to try and get your arms across uh, all um, vehicle carbon emissions across a whole uh, urban area. Uh, and it's an attractive uh, approach because the, the scale potentially of the data collection that's needed is daunting. Uh, and I'm sure 
Jason would agree that uh, the data collected as part of the Sharing Cities initiative is really just the tip of the iceberg here. So we don't want data collection to be a barrier to action, but some measurement is better than none. Um, and it's something that will mature as initiatives like Sharing Cities start to gain traction. Now, of course, uh, climate view, um, they still, still maintain that um, data collection is vital. Um, so don't want to misrepresent them. But my point is you can start with some data and a lot of extrapolation, and that can mature as we um, onboard new data sets and drive further towards data-driven understanding. Uh, let me illustrate this with some work that we did recently for the Greater London Authority. Uh, what you're looking at here is a uh, visualization of air quality uh, in London. Uh, it's down to the resolution of these 300 meter wide hexagons um, as an hour granularity, um, different types of pollutants can be visualized and there's a 48 hour prediction. So quite a powerful uh, tool, uh, both for citizens and the city. But what sits behind it is some really clever AI um, that uh, the Alan Turing Institute have put together. So they combine data from weather, from uh, ground stations measuring air quality, uh, from uh, urban land use and traffic flows, and pull that into a digital twin that allows them to make these kind of predictions. Now, the point here is that um, across central London, there's only 100 um, of these very accurate uh, air quality measuring stations. And that means most of what you're seeing on screen here is interpolation. And clearly, as the air quality measurement increases and we get more hyperlocal sensing, we'll move more from a predictive model to a model which is um, filled with real data. Uh, so I guess it's a very sophisticated example, but of course, simpler approaches are also applicable as well. Uh, some of you may be aware of the uh, C40 Cities uh, Initiative. Um, and they're recommending a kind of top-down approach, looking at consumer behavior within a city, uh, but still some data collection is needed. So I guess my point is uh, not to let the scale of the challenge overwhelm you and uh, prevent you getting started. Um, I uh, get, In my job, I get to speak to a lot of passionate people who are working in data in cities um, who are, are not overwhelmed by this and still passionately believe in data-driven decision-making in this area. My third point is when a new intervention is introduced, make a plan to measure its effectiveness. Uh, I'm going to illustrate this with some uh, information from the Liverpool uh, Clean Air Plan, which I ended up reading in quite a lot of detail as part of working in a consortium. So along the bottom of this slide, you can see uh, air quality is mentioned, so clearly we need to measure that. Um, but there's a range of other uh, interventions that Liverpool City Council were considering um, uh, and eventually will procure some of these which will um, help address uh, their air quality issues. Uh, my suggestion was to place um, more emphasis on the integration which is this blue bit in the middle allowing these different um, uh, uh, siloed applications to talk to each other and uh, have closed loop effects uh, between air quality and interventions but also the benefit management, prediction, reporting, and analytics. And that was for two reasons, really. In Liverpool's case, their um, uh, clean air plan requires them to be able to measure the cost effectiveness of those interventions. And uh, that's difficult to do if you haven't gathered some information about that intervention and seen what its correlating effect is on the climate. Um, and secondly, uh, Liverpool are committed to making sure interventions like this affect different parts of the city in a fair and equitable way. My fourth point is around data sharing, both in the um, private sector and public sector. A couple of weeks ago, I was able to put a question to um, Carly Kind, who's the director of the Ava Lovelace Institute, around the effect that COVID-19 has had on um, data sharing between both uh, commercial and um, public organizations. Her observation is that a number of the barriers to data sharing had either been eliminated or reduced as a result of the pandemic and uh, some of that uh, spirit of collaboration is something we want to see um, going forward as well. Let me illustrate that with another KNOS project again uh, in London um, and you may have seen it briefly in James's slide earlier actually. The point of this uh, project was to try and find uh, optimal locations for multi-vehicle electric vehicle charging stations, which is kind of aimed at um, commercial traffic, really. Um, now, on this 
map, it's not that easy to see, but there's a combination of open data, so things like um, traffic flows and land use information, combined with um, private sector data around the um, location and capacity of electricity uh, charging substations uh, and the uh, land requirements for developers of new uh, EV charging hubs. Now, although the part of the point of this project was around data sharing, uh, frustratingly, some of those issues are actually quite hard to solve. And of course, they weren't technology problems. Um, now, that's, I guess, one of, why one of the learnings from the Sharing Cities initiative is that cities need to be able to own and freely license their own data so that um, data sharing initiatives like this become much easier in future. It's probably worth mentioning as well that uh, both of these London projects were funded by uh, Kanos and Microsoft because both companies passionately want to see these kind of initiatives succeed and flourish. My final point is about uh, accountability. Uh, and this really takes us from open, um, from data sharing to open data and transparency. Uh, this is core to some of the work we're doing in Kanos in sustainability, uh, not just on the kind of climate change emergency, but the 16 other UN sustainable development goals as well. And uh, uh, clearly, obviously, the, the kind of uh, measurement applies equally to those as well. So data collection, reporting, analysis, it's all part of that transparency and open data agenda. So uh, for all these reasons, um, I have uh, included features like data brokers, data transparency as features of the Kanos uh, city uh, data ecosystem, uh, which is an open data architecture that uh, we're hoping to trial in a UK city this autumn. Uh, I'd love to tell you more about that, but my time's up. So I'm now going to hand over to uh, Councillor Anna Richardson to tell you more about what's happening in Glasgow. Anna. Thank you, Bill, for that. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here this morning to share a little bit of the ambition and the work that's going on in Glasgow and to give a city's perspective on this topic. I'm going to touch on various initiatives that are happening here in Glasgow, but I also intend to always bring it back to the people that are the heart of our smart cities, and they're the people that we are ultimately here to serve. So we find ourselves in a very different world to that of last year's All Energy Conference, when the climate crisis was taking centre stage like never before. I think we were all rapidly coming to terms with quite how quickly we need to decarbonise our cities. But the last six months have now taken our toll on our populations and our public services in another way that none of us could have imagined. And the inequalities that were always present have been highlighted even more starkly by the COVID crisis. The financial consequences we face as households and as civic bodies will still take some time to fully unravel. So when we reimagine a smart city now, we need to really look at what these solutions bring to our communities. And what's clearest of all is that we need a recovery now that will be green and fair. We must be open to innovation and to try new ways of working more than ever before. And in Glasgow, we firmly believe in partnerships and collaboration as key to doing so successfully. So, for example, Glasgow is the only Scottish city to have been invited to join the Metrolab network, a key collaboration across US cities and universities, with a focus on smart city solutions to urban challenges, and particularly in relation to sustainability. And Glasgow will be presenting its work to tackle the climate emergency at the summit of this network in late October. And we've also recently become a member of the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance, a group of cities with ambitious targets for achieving carbon neutrality, and one in which smart city approaches to urban sustainability has to be at the forefront of our discussion. Because the Smart Cities Agenda offers us opportunities to improve frontline services as we decarbonise them. And of course, our focus must never waver from offering the best quality of life for our citizens through evidence-based delivery of services. Data enables us to make the right choices and to prioritise our resources appropriately. So our city has been progressing a significant partnership with the University of Strathclyde, along with Berkeley and Stanford, to install monitors on school roofs across Glasgow, which will capture data on carbon emissions and potentially permit better real-time feedback on the effects of policy interventions, as was just being spoken about in the previous presentation. This is a new way of accessing this data. It offers different possibilities from a reliance on emissions data that has been collected in previous years, as we often do at the moment. It's really drawing together research, policy and practice through a town-gown approach to the smart city and sustainability agenda. And a smart city must be one where technology improves the lives of everybody, just as decarbonisation is a tool to tackle fuel poverty, food insecurity and transport inequalities if we do it right. 
I strongly believe that we must mainstream sustainability and equalities through every policy decision. That's what will make our city a better place. And we know the issues that matter to our people. They continually tell us that transport is a key issue that can improve their lives. Only last week, we began consultation on a new ambitious transport strategy for Glasgow. We intend to use this new strategy as a tool to make the city carbon neutral by 2030, while improving connectivity to parts of the city that have not been easily accessible in the past. But we're very fortunate to also be able to work closely with academic partners, such as the Urban Big Data Centre at the University of Glasgow, on the rich variety of data sets that we have on transport usage, modal preferences, weather effects, and levels of both carbon emissions and air pollutants. And with that, the potential opportunities for the use of smart city interventions to both reduce emissions and move away from dependence on private cars. And we can map behaviour and also shape behaviour change through strategic use of technology. So the Council supported a local challenge for SMEs in this year's Scottish Government CivTech Challenge, which has led to the development of an app which will help individuals work out their carbon footprint on their daily lives and to support changes to reduce it. And this follows a previous CivTech Challenge for Glasgow, where we use data from residents' travel choices to help map out where public transport provision needs to be improved across the city. But while we make every effort to reduce emissions, we know that a level of climate change is already baked in. The impacts of changing weather patterns, including more flooding, will hit those in our city who can least afford it. So here again is an example of our commitment to a fairer, healthier city, being supported through data. The City Region's key partnership for adaptation to climate change, Climate Ready Clyde, has pioneered the use of data, mapping tools and economic analysis to assess the risks and opportunities of investing in climate resilience across metropolitan Glasgow. And work on nature-based solutions, especially through the EU Connecting Nature project, has similarly used data analysis and digital tools to assess the effectiveness of green-blue interventions to build climate resilience and to improve the quality of life. And that applies to our natural resources as well. They've often been hiding in plain sight. So smart city technology will help to unlock their potential. We and other city stakeholders are identifying smart ways to capture heat in the city and use it to sustainably heat our buildings, whether that's heat that's been stored in the ground or in our waterways. And along the way, we hope to make significant inroads into the fuel poverty that affects too many of our people. But if we're to meet the targets we've set ourselves, we need demonstrators that are rapidly scalable and give us the learning we need to replicate them across Glasgow. And one such project is Ruggedised, an EU Horizon funded project, bringing together a number of public, private and academic partners here in Glasgow to create a smart energy district in the city centre. The communications network that will be created through the installation of intelligent streetlights will be used to dynamically manage energy flows, firstly within the project district and then beyond. We'll be trying EV charging on these streetlights, reducing pavement clutter, and turning the multi-storey car park into a smart building that generates and stores electrical energy and utilises it to then power EVs. The building will use large batteries to store that energy and communicate with the local energy grid, providing services that help to reduce the carbon intensity of the grid and maximise local use of locally created energy. And we aim to then replicate this approach in our other car parks, turning them into major assets as part of our city infrastructure. And all of this work so far helped Glasgow to meet and exceed its 2020 carbon emissions reduction target two years ahead of schedule. But now we know we have to move forward at a new pace and at scale to reach carbon neutrality by 2030, a daunting yet necessary target that we are determined to achieve. Big infrastructure projects matter as part of this, and we have to now shift from pilots to significant investments in transport, heat and service delivery. They illustrate the scale of change that's required and they inspire our citizens to see their city as one with high ambitions and are determined to succeed in this green revolution. But the smart city can also be invisible and unnoticed. From the bins that are swiftly collected, buses that run on time, EV charging points that are a seamless part of our streetscape, air that's clean and constantly monitored, street lighting that adapts to make pedestrians feel safe, whatever the conditions, and buildings that are warm and pleasant without a large carbon footprint. All of these improvements make for a city that's simply better for day-to-day -day living. Smart cities may use the language of technology and innovation, but our main driver has to always be our people. Of course, a smart city will be more sustainable, but it should also be fairer and improve services and quality of life for everybody. That's our vision here in Glasgow, and I'm confident that we're now well on our way to delivering it. And now I'm going to hand over to Gary Bennett.
Many thanks, Anna. Fantastic. Um, great to see some amazing things going on in uh, in Glasgow, and I think some inspirational things that, that I think many cities can learn from. Um, so I've taken a slightly different view in terms of just the um, sustainability point, but actually from a sort of almost like a, a hardware perspective, from a how how are we actually deploying things, and actually what do we see from sharing in terms of a light view, and what are some of those challenges? Um, so my presentation really is about the facts of some of those challenges, and what I've put together is really a SWOT. So if I take um, Urbis Radar, so we've been providing lighting and solutions uh, for over 35 years, from functional road lighting, uh, urban modular connected solutions, and we have around 5 million deployed luminaires across the UK and Ireland. But what we see is a, a challenge in terms of sharing on. So um, the openness, uh, that was covered a little bit by Jason. I think the interoperability covered by James, that we need to make sure that the technology is really supporting not just the city, the space, but also the citizens going forward. Um, we have a challenge though, um, because you know, as citizens, we embrace and welcome technology. And of course, as we look at that technology, it can improve our energy consumption, the way we manufacture those products, the, the longevity of those products, and the way that they can be used. But we actually have a habit of replacing and mainly disposing of technology um, when we no longer value it. So I think it's really important, again, as we look at technology, as we look at smart, as we look at sustainability, we have to think of the longer term value, not just the immediate things that we can fix today. Because just in the UK alone, we dispose of over 50 million tons of e-waste annually. And, and I guess the other thing that we can't ignore in terms of cities is that, you know, their economies in their own right. And they're pushing for more citizens, greater economic value. Uh, which drives different needs and speeds and sometimes conflicts in sharing as well. So therefore, the reality is every city wants to be that best city, exactly as Anna just shared. There's some amazing things going on in Glasgow, but the same for Milan, the same for Barcelona, same for cities globally in terms of how they're trying to improve their position. So if I take it from a lighting perspective, you know, let's take the smart pole. It's, uh, it's not actually a new idea, to be, to be fair, you know, a lighting column, share the technology to benefit from others. And, and what did we pretty much end up with? Uh, we ended up with a, a big old hodgepodge of stuff where actually it's not really solving the problem. It's just solving a, a challenge of today. And actually it becomes unsustainable because the technology that's put up is, is not there really to support the, the future. You know, the challenge for us in, in sharing cities is really to try and tear up the 30-year-old step-by-step approach. We have a lot of funding mechanisms. We have a lot of um, uh, specifications. We have a lot of challenges in terms of how we look to manage our day-to-day -day needs for the city and for the citizen but actually we really don't we just replicate waste in services in installation and we don't really use technology for the wider benefits so what i put together is a, is a small swat to um, sort of what have we learned from a lighting perspective in terms of from sharing cities so if you look at some of the strengths you know what are we seeing there is clear strengths uh, the uh, the open dialogue um, it's considering the citizen not just the citizens problem so therefore there's a real interaction between the two which is really encouraging to see because at the end of the day citizens make a city a city is nothing without its citizens and clearly the sustainability is important to the citizens and whether it's transport whether it's the air quality whether it's how they move through that space where they work in that space it's important that obviously that open dialogue is there and, and that is it is a huge thing um, the shared use cases that build confidence. Um, so while this afternoon we'll be talking about how actually perhaps not to do pilots, but actually how can we more share the, the successes that we've had in, in different cities in order to build that confidence to ensure that we're investing in the right way. Lighting, not just as a pole, can deliver new opportunities to enhance cities and citizens. It, we deal in solid state technology now. So the reality is, is that we have the ability from a light perspective to give so many different experiences, whether it's the light itself, whether it's enhancing the environment, and even to the fact of how the modularity of that product can enhance other features, such as environmental, EV charging, et cetera, et cetera. And when you look at the connectivity, 5G, et cetera, also has to come into play. Local authorities are open and wider partnering processes. So I think if you look at it, historically it was very much, well, that's somebody else's job, give me a solution for it. But there very much is a strategy in, in most local authorities now to drive in that sustainability, drive in that sharing, and a much wider dialogue that really drives a, a benefit for all of us. Um, solve real world issues and, and create rich, valuable insights for tomorrow. I think the data, uh, as Bill described, is absolutely important for us, but we have to somehow stress test that data for the future. You know, none of us necessarily saw a pandemic coming, but what could we have done in terms of the, the, the technology that we have and the wider deployed capabilities to be able to improve our position in cities and for our, our citizens? And more importantly, we look at sustainability. We 
can see that that data can actually help us improve today, but actually, is it really driving our, our, our future habits of, um, uh, in, in, in technology as well as the infrastructure that we put in place? Uh, and the discussions are on solutions, not just technology, which I think is really um, uh, an important um, strength in terms of the sharing cities process. But there's weaknesses, and those weaknesses really, the funding and the tendering process can limit true impact. It's very much uh, a silo. It's very much focus on one thing today, but not really thinking about the journey of the future. And I think we've seen as a lighting business that uh, by technology, you know, the partnerships try to push their core agendas. And, you know, where, you know, we've partnering with Microsoft and we've seen there's a very open approach. And, and from that perspective, it's been really refreshing for us because in a lot of cases, everyone wants to push their thing onto the product or onto the platform. And I think we have to take a much more pragmatic view for that. And that, that is a weakness in terms of the approach of the sharing cities. I think continue the push on smart rather than connected, you know, really smart. If, if cities were smart, then I guess like the Incas would still be around, right? The reality is we, we need to be connected. Communication, travel, everything is important. The, if, if we think about the, the, the way that we communicate with each other, the way that information travels, it's really that connected piece that allows us to make smart decisions. And we need to make sure that we drive a network that is open um, and that is really driving um, something that can create a, an open protocol for all of us. Narrative needs to be aligned. I think we talk a lot in jargon. Um, smart, 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 I think is somewhat oversubscribed. Um, but the reality is we really should talk about the narrative that affects the key stakeholders, the, the key things in terms of day to day. Actually, how does it affect you as a citizen by having EV charging? How does it affect you in terms of actually having environmental monitoring? What are those, those things in terms of going forward? Never confuse motion for action, you know, plan to pilot, not for scale. I think pilots, again, are not really the scale. And technology seen as a solution. Um, it really, it needs to be an enabler, not necessarily um, just a solution to all our problems. There's great opportunities. Um, you know, create a city canvas, not just a smart city. How can you keep painting that? How can you keep improving that? Um, break the kudos. Too many chefs in the design. Um, how do we make sure that we build a community trust across those um, those areas? And how do we have shared policies on infrastructure? Uh, how do we make it interoperable? And how do we, as Jason said, how do we how do we create that sort of community open standard that is truly open, not just a whole bunch of uh, APIs? And then the threats, you know, the, really these are these are critical. You know, we don't want to enter a technology and evolutionary dead end, which we can't recover from. Um, you know, we need to not just celebrate today, we need to think about the future value, that therefore we can do these small things that do improve our sustainability, do improve our, 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 our environment, but the reality is, are they actually transferable for the future? Are they an ongoing thing? Um, is technology being forced um, rather than adopted, um, and therefore people don't see it as a value? Uh, and I think really we need to be also treating investments as not just a one-time event, but really leaving a legacy of a system that allows us to keep going and going and going. So I think at the end of the day, fantastic things going on in terms of the sharing cities. But again, I don't think we're quite there yet. We need to really push on those opportunities. We need to probably share more openly. And, and as a lighting manufacturer, you know, we have a lot of deployed nodes and we have a lot of more deployed nodes that we will uh, provide to cities that really need to be part of that infrastructure going forward to make sure that there's a journey for the city. And, and we'll be discussing that later at two o'clock this afternoon. So that was really a short overview, but I think something that I think hopefully can stimulate some conversation and hopefully some questions. Let's get some questions coming in so the panel can, can really talk about those. And it's really important that we push this agenda going forwards because actually the future is for all of us. And let's face it, we want to be in cities that people love to live in. So it's important for us. And thank you very much. And I'm now going to hand back to Claire. Gary, thank you for that. And thanks to all of our panelists for their really fascinating insights into the value of data and how it can really facilitate change. Um, I'm hoping the audience's appetite has been whetted and there's a myriad of questions hurtling through the ether towards me. Um, but I'm going to take advantage of my position as chairperson to ask a couple of questions in the first instance while, while our audience are, are typing away. Um, if I can ask the first question of James. So there's a number of solutions that the Sharing Cities project is recommending for, for cities to consider adopting. Where do you think you're seeing the most traction in terms of the conversations you've had so far? 
Uh, yeah, good question. So I think on um, there's probably three areas I would I would pick on. Um, one is absolutely around um, data. So you know that concept of an urban data ecosystem or, or urban data platform. Um, that really is key, and and a, and a hot topic of how do you secure an anonymized data. So that's definitely one element. Um, the second element is street lighting for sure. I mean, uh, you know, Gary has 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 just finished a great session covering um, the role of Shredder, but, uh, but 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 I think it's just a very interesting space. You know, if you think about some of the examples that Count Councillor Richardson gave, um, which have um, integrated into them, um, you know, that's that is fantastic. You know, that modular approach um, is key. Um, and, and we see those discussions um, or those, those um, questions coming up a lot from our engagements, but also building energy management, um, but not only just around, um, I guess, energy consumption, but, but in wider smart building solutions. So, you know, for example, think about housing associations. We are increasingly pulled into a number of discussions with housing associations where they're looking for not only building energy, energy management, but also leak detection or fire detection, um, but still very much in, in the realm of, um, of smart or, or intelligent buildings. Um, so I'd probably pick on those three. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, we've got quite a lengthy question from the audience, um, which I will direct shortly. But the question is, how do we implement cross-sector and cross-organizational governance around our activities to decarbonize? We have strong governance around financial management with teams of accountants and auditors who ensure that we monitor and manage the flow of funds around our ecosystem. Can we apply a similar approach to the management of carbon? Jason, I think you're looking desperate to answer that question. Can I come to you in the first sentence, please? Sure, nice easy one to start with. I don't think there's an easy answer to this, but what I do know is that there is not a forum where all of the UK cities that are leaders in smart city projects and have the experience all get together uh, and they discuss what's worked, what hasn't worked, and create a set of templates and guidance that other cities can follow. Um, I mean, it's a big gap in the UK. Other European countries have national forums when this very activity takes place. So. If I was hard, one thing that we can do from a sort of governmental level, even if it's just a peer-to-peer a -peer activity between those sort of leader cities, that would be a great start. Terrific, and thoroughly agree with that. I'd like to bring Anna in at this point because I think it actually leads into what Glasgow are doing, and I'm keen to understand what, if any, um, you know approaches that Glasgow are trailblazing that, that could help other cities who are looking at solutions and whether there is that degree of collaboration and accountability amongst local authorities to help facilitate this journey. Yeah, I think it's really clear that none of us have time now to reinvent the wheel. Where we have solutions eh, and where cities are doing things well, we should be learning from one another. Um, and that hopefully it came across in my presentation that I'm far more interested in collaboration and partnership um, than you know any sort of competitiveness. I think when that's a friendly competitiveness, that's that's a really positive thing um, in terms of, of you know spurring us all on. Um, but certainly we need to learn from one another, and, and that's the most important thing. One of the lessons that I think has become really clear, um, we knew this already, but it's, it's really emerged from uh, our climate emergency response, is that we can't do this as local authorities on our own, um, but we have to set the pace and we have to set the ambition and we have to um, show that leadership in our cities by saying that we intend to go this quickly and um, get our own house in order, so do the work that we need to do in-house uh, to manage our own carbon emissions. But that is a very small percentage of the city's emissions as a whole. Um, and the only way that we're going to get there is if um, the private sector, if all um, organisations get on board, if individuals um, start to buy into the behaviour change that's necessary, as well as the system-wide changes that we need to see. And we need to be very closely aligned with what governments are doing as well. Um, there's a huge amount of our emissions that um, we need that support from government, whether that's in, in policy making um, to enable us to, to take some of the barriers away, or whether that's directly funding and local authorities organisations that are doing this work. Um, we can't do it alone. Uh, we have to all be working together. Uh, and I think that's something that we are trying to make very clear. Um, we work with um, organisations across the city that are, are doing 
um, good pieces of work. We support them where we can, um, and I think that's the only way that we're going to get get moving. Um, and I think there's also a lot to be said for learning from cities because urban environments have very similar challenges. When you look at some of the, the challenges that um, Scotland as a country has, um, we're in a very different position to a lot of our rural local authorities. So we perhaps have more in common with um, cities within Europe or within the US or further afield uh, in terms of the challenges we have around mobility, around heat, around population density and how we can really um, make the most of that. So um, we do need to be learning, we need to be looking well out with our own borders, we need to learn from one another um, and I think that partnership, um, if you think of it, it's a race where all of us have to get across the finish line if any of us are going to win um, and if we keep that in mind uh, we help one another um, to move faster at the same time as, as we do our own work uh, within our own boundaries. Now this is uh, where Anna, I'm sure you're pleased that there's 50 miles between us as I'm sitting in Edinburgh because I'm going to challenge you a little bit further on that. Because the one thing that having worked in, and you know, I worked on Glasgow's uh, LED street lighting project back in 2015, you are a uh, thought leader in this area and Glasgow definitely has first mover advantage in relation to a number of projects. But how can cities be encouraged to work together because at the moment, there are pockets of activity, and I mentioned at the start of this uh, discussion the number of local authorities across the UK. They're not communicating. Is there is there a need for a forum? Should we be looking to capital cities and cities like Glasgow to take the lead to congregate and aggregate and make sure that the right people are having the conversations from a public sector perspective? Yeah, I think that makes sense, uh, and it comes right back to, as I said, we can't. We don't have time. We can't afford to be learning the same lessons over and over. So, um, for example, um, on on certain policies around air quality, um, I sit on a group with two cabinet secretaries and uh, leaders from uh, uh, you know policy leaders from the four cities in Scotland because we have to get low emission zones done, um, which are obviously an air quality uh, improvement, but will have some climate benefits as well. And we need to get those in quickly. And we have been moving forward on that. And through that we can we can uh, hopefully make it a little bit easier for those that come after us. That's one policy area where Glasgow is, is ahead uh, of the game. There are other policy areas where other cities are doing some great stuff and I'm thinking of Dundee and their electric vehicle work and um, they really have got a lot um, that we can be inspired by and Edinburgh is also doing incredible amounts of work um, through through a lot of what they're taking forward. So um, I think there's lots of opportunities there for all of us to learn from one another um, and as I'm saying, you know, with, with air quality, we are doing that a uh, very close cooperation between cities, both officer level and at political levels. And um, maybe we need to do that more holistically uh, in terms of our carbon ambitions as well. That's uh, I'm always up for more partnership, more collaboration, even with Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> well said. That's touche, I think. <laughs> um, Gary, can I come to you, please? Because one of the questions that's come in, I guess, is quite a technical question, but it, it talks about with respect to highway and street lighting installed sensors, are these battery driven or connected to the mains electricity? If the sensors are connected to the mains, which are predominantly unmetered on highway lighting systems, do they have an Alexon charge code which is required prior to connection to an unmetered supply? I have no idea what the answer to that is. So it's a, it's, a, it's a mixed bag, actually. Um, so uh, yes, generally, uh, they, so if you look at the um, uh, the control nodes, generally that sit on top of the luminaire, they are a low voltage um, sensor. Um, they will have an Alexon code um, uh, in order because of the unmetered supply. Um, but then when you look at adjacent sensors, so environmental sensors, they can be both, I would say, battery, but also solar powered. So they can be um, actually off the unmetered supply or they can be with it as well. So it really depends on the, the, the solution. Again, it, I think it raises the question. It's a really good question because there is no one standard. So as you look around lighting and you look around the fact that we have Alexon as a standard um, protocol in terms of unmetered supply, and obviously we have to be compliant for that. Um, but the reality is when you start to move outside it, it's really just how can we connect different things to columns rather than actually using the lighting as that, let's say, sensory platform. Uh, and that's one of the things we've been working on is that how do we integrate within the, the product things that actually you can turn on and off so it becomes a, a solid state feature because again in all cases you don't need something to be powered all the time and not everything needs to have the same capability in terms of sensor so again it comes back to the design and thinking about how that lighting design would be done and, and how the design around the city would be applicable um, but also making sure that when you look at the sensors that you look about as part of the journey so when we when we look at a, a city program or we look at a design 
we have three levels of sort of design layer, the basic lighting design, we have a connected lighting design, and what we do is we bring into play the, the requirements from, you know, for example, the telecommunications, whether it be 5G, the connectivity, CCTV, where CCTV would need to be um, applied, um, and then any sort of additional sensors in order to make sure that we can get, firstly, the best energy benefit for, for, the, um, uh, for the local authority or for the end customer, um, but also make sure that from a sustainability perspective going forward, in a lot of cases, those those systems can be reused and redeployed around the city. So therefore, actually, you don't have to have a one-time fit and it just sits there. And then after after three months of proving that, yes, that area is polluted or, yes, that area has a lot of traffic, the reality is it can be redeployed to, to other areas, which makes it a lot more sustainable, but also allows to keep a, a sort of journey going in terms of the benefits of those products. So, so for us, it's really working with those standards. We work with a lot of different industries to try and work with those standards and work out how lighting can play a part of that in terms of the deployment as well as the platform, but also ensure that as part of the, the unmetered supply, that the reality is, is that we also sort of try and do it once rather than do it three or four times. So um, a good example is that you know we may provide moving from sort of HID to LED a sort of 60% energy improvement, but in a lot of cases we won't also be doing the control part of that. So therefore the reality is we can deploy almost the network and the control at the same time as the luminaire, which actually provides not only additional benefits in terms of sustainability and energy, it also provides savings in terms of how much effort has to go into the installation, the the the, the amount of traffic that needs to, to, to go out onto the road for delivery, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it really becomes a sort of how can we drive more of a circular approach? And really from our perspective, we think that's a key thing. Circular is very much focused at the moment in our view on just really focused on recycling. How actually can we extend more the life of the product and make sure that those ongoing benefits can be addressed? So, so yep, it, it's it's a mixed bag, and so there's not one answer. And I think that is one of the, the challenges. So it's a great question. It's it's something that, from an industry perspective, lighting has to try and really break, if I put it that way. But we need the support of our customers. It's not something we can break as, as one standard. So, yeah. Delighted to know that you were the right person to answer that question, Gary. <laughs> um, the next question I have is one that's pretty close to my own heart um, and the work that I'm doing with the Edinburgh Climate Commission. And the question is, how does data help us in developing strategies to tackle the decarbonisation of heat and transport, which remain the two biggest carbon intensive energy uses? That's certainly something that's exercising the mind in Edinburgh at the moment with, with those heat and transport are the key things that need to be tracked. Um, could I come to you, Bill, in the first instance, because I'm conscious that you talked about baselines and tracking emissions and, and you know, the C40s initiative in terms of measuring and tracking. Uh, yes, so thanks, Beth. Uh, I should give you the opportunity to comment as well. Um, so, uh, okay, so I think uh, if you think about what I was saying about uh, Liverpool and clean air, it comes down to two things, in, in my opinion measurement and intervention and uh, so there's lots of kind of different measurement solutions um, traffic counting um, what I'm quite keen on is um, traffic counting solutions where you're able to get an idea of what kind of vehicle it is and the emissions if you use technology like ANPR you can um, kind of look up and, and find out um, what kind of level of emission each vehicle is giving you because it's my kind of personal suspicion that a small uh, number of vehicles are kind of responsible for a disproportionate amount of carbon if you look at uh, some more uh, kind of advanced cities, uh, so, so again, then the, the question is, um, uh, what's the intervention you could do there? Um, lots of things like low emission zones seem to be increasingly popular, and other cities are introducing uh, specific uh, solutions for uh, booking um, uh, delivery slots uh, to optimise last mile uh, deliveries, because actually increasingly the traffic profile in our cities is people delivering things in one way or another. Um, to, to briefly talk about, um, well, I guess uh, heating in large buildings will probably end up covering that this afternoon with um, Iconics and using smart building technology to optimise that. The, the one that's kind of worrying me quite a lot is um, heating in domestic homes um, because it kind of each home is, it, is a kind of microcosm. How do you optimise that? It could be one of the most difficult areas to tackle. Um, and that's why I was kind of pleased to see the um, government's Green Homes Initiative. I think that you can't apply for it yet, but it'd be interesting to see whether um, what the uptake is like for that and what kind of schemes are included. 
so we're working with a, a very small company that are looking to introduce um, IoT technology into domestic boilers. Uh, and I think this could be absolutely revolutionary because if that technology can uh, make a small impact to the efficiency of kind of each and every boiler, then that wider impact will be absolutely huge. Um, so it, the, the technology does things like it's predictive maintenance, it works out when the boiler is running, running in an in efficient way and restarting itself and so on. So uh, those are some of the kind of technologies and clearly then uh, data is still at the core of that, right, because we're gathering that together and uh, coming back to the measurement. So it's a constant cycle of measurement and intervention. Um, that's a, a brief answer. Um, Claire, I'm sure you've got some views as well, Being is it close to your heart? Well, we're still in a discussion mode at the moment. Um, the commission has been uh, looking at the data that has been collated. And um, one of the challenges that we've got, particularly in the context of transport, is the whole transport system needs to be revisited based on what's happened because of COVID. People are working from home. Uh, announcements have come from companies like Google and Apple and other big players. Uh, I can ask James his view on the Microsoft uh, view of life, where they're saying that people will continue to work at home. Um, you know, there won't be a mass exodus back from home, back into the city, into offices, and people will be sitting in their houses, working yeah. and functioning. And so you then, it's not only a question of how do you decarbonize transport, the question is what transport do you need? Um, what's fit for purpose in this brave new world of COVID and living with it, pre-vaccine being, being, uh, being <laughs> I guess, invented? I mean, James, what's, what's your view on this from a Microsoft perspective? Um, well, there's a, there's a few different elements, really. I mean, I, I think, you know, well, first of all, um, from the working, home, working from home standpoint, I think it's very interesting to see the developments across, you know, our own, our own products like Teams, but also, you know, from other, other products such as Zoom and, and the rapid rate at which those solutions to enable working from home um, make it more accessible, make it more inclusive, has been very interesting, you know, to see that that rapid change, you know, so there's a constant change at the moment across those platforms to enable better working from home. Um, but I think also what we see is that, of course, with smart building technologies, there is a lot of um, focus at the moment on being able to encourage um, workers back to the office. So, for example, being able to um, track uh, individual office workers um, in and, and typically anon anonymizing that to the point where um, if there is a case of COVID then they're able to go back and track where that individual was in the building um, to be in those areas to be able to contact the individuals that they were in touch with during that time in the office. So those are the type of scenarios that um, we're increasingly seeing at the moment. Um, and then I think uh, outside of that, we're also um, being pulled into conversations around how we can help support things like social distancing um, and how solutions can help with things like not only pedestrian counting and people flow, but then also being able to analyze, you know, is social distancing being followed, are masks being worn, um, and technology is at the heart of enabling those, whether it's through things like cognitive uh, vision enabled um, cameras um, or, or in the office example I gave, you know, with, with kind of um, beacon technologies. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of different um, dialogues happening at the moment. But but I think it, it fundamentally, as you say, that it, it comes back to um, that, I guess, that um, that trend of, you know, just how much are we going to see people staying at home now versus versus being encouraged to go back to work. And if they are encouraged to go back to work, how is that being measured, monitored, so that there's more confidence in going back to the workplace, if that makes sense? Yeah. I think we've we've struck a chord because I'm keen to come to Bill and then also Anna to get their views. If I can come to Bill, first of all, what's your take on the working from home point? I know yeah, we've so kind of evolved. <laughs> yeah, just to quickly pick on that up on that point, um, clearly there are some kind of major transport advantages from working from home, but uh, at the same time, everyone is having to heat their own homes. And there's some really interesting research being done like three or four years ago in the UK that told you the length of journey you would have to take before it became more uh, carbon effective to work from home 
versus traveling to the office. I, I know I think on a rail journey, it's on like 16 miles in a car, you can drive five miles and it's still more better for the environment to drive to the office and have the office heated um, centrally and it, using smart building technology, et cetera, than to individually heat your own home, which, which isn't an argument for saying everyone should go back to the office. It's more an argument to say, actually, the domestic heating uh, agenda is one that I think we need to be paying more attention to. That's fascinating. I had no idea that those stats were out there. I'm just delighted that I'm not getting up at half past four in the morning to get the red light. <laughs> Anna, can I come to you, please? Yeah, um, I was having very similar thoughts there myself. Certainly when we look at um, our emissions, uh, we want to consider um, working from home and different working solutions as part of of, of how we tackle our own council emissions and yet there is that trade-off. Are we um, going from a building where there's there's building management systems in place um, and therefore the emissions can be managed on a systems level into places like my own home where the heating is going on and off um, with not very much insulation and you know and we create that problem across thousands of employees and where is that trade-off um, and how do we make sure that we're doing the right thing? If we don't have the right data there, um, we won't be able to make those right choices. Uh, but certainly there are other impacts as well in terms of lifestyle around those who have a better quality of life from not travelling. So we can't be expecting everybody um, to go to the office on the train just so that we're managing our carbon emissions. We need to be finding ways of tackling this. And perhaps this is a time where um, a lot of folks have been on transport and actually what we need to be focusing now on is thinking a lot about the heat agenda eh, and domestic heat especially. Um, I just wanted to make one um, point around working from home that I'm very conscious of and, and certainly transport has been um, possibly the, the piece of my portfolio that's kept me busiest over the last six months um, and there's been huge changes in travel patterns but not everybody is working from home, not everybody can work from home um, and we have so many of our key workers um, in so many different sectors who will never have this option of sitting on a webcam safely away from, from the virus. And there is a risk there that as um, we change transport networks, um, there is a risk that those are perhaps groups that are reliant on public transport um, that don't have the option to move into private vehicle um, use. They don't own cars. What are we doing there? How are we making sure that our data um, fills, fills in those blanks for us so that we are getting the public transport, the, the bike share, the car share, all of those things in the places that those workers need so that they can travel safely and easily um, while many of us have changed our routines. There could be a lot of benefit there in terms of less congested roads um, so that people can move more easily, but only if we're putting in the right networks um, and making sure that, that people can get to where they need to go. And that's not always into the city centre and back out at nine and five, the way we've often planned our transport networks. So I think we need to do that better and we need to have data at the heart of that. Yeah, great. Thank you for that, Anna. I've got a question for Jason, if I may, and I guess it comes back to the Sharing Cities project. Um, one of the questions from the audience is what role is there for renewable energy in all of this? And my perception is that COVID has brought together sectors in a way that it ha has never happened before. So people are collaborating and speaking and hopefully going forward will be working together closer than they ever had cause to do before. Um, so one of the challenges that we've always had historically is left hand speaking to right hand connecting the dots and we've spent this morning talking about how data and IT and IoT can, can make a difference. But what level of collaboration has there been with the developers, with the people who are active in the clean energy sector who actually deploy the technology to reduce those carbon emissions? Jason, can I come to you to ask your experience on, on how that's worked out so far? That's a complex question. Actually, some of it's um, hard to get actually to the discussion that we've just had, which I think actually articulated really the use case for a smart city and particularly the sharing of data in the smart city. Because the discussion we just had, you know, you have very distinct areas of, of data and projects from, from transport, from working from home to home heating to office heating. Now, the only way we're going to decarbonize with all those which would currently be separate projects as they were quite separate in sharing cities with only the, pla the data platform being the glue that provided some valuable information by cities to create real insight. Um, you know, and that's what's also one of the fundamental challenges around um, smart cities is, you know, these different solution areas, different use case areas of, you know, energy efficiency at home, to energy efficiency in 
the office to the energy taken to get from home to the office are completely separate in almost every smart city project there, are, there has ever been. So until we can find a way of, of actually um, having a project that covers all of those areas, then you know we're never going to be as efficient and you know achieve the levels of, of, of carbon reduction that we would like to achieve. So I think that's an important point, and again, it might be a takeaway for those that want to sort of um, attend this afternoon session, which will cover some of those points in a bit more detail, is how we integrate those separate projects, particularly using data to create more benefit. And how that relates to energy, um, there's actually a very good example in, in, in sharing cities. So there we have the, concept, the, the concept of um, energy management across a whole district. Uh, we call it SAM, Sustainable Energy Management System. So the idea was that we would um, look at both the supply and generation of energy, both locally through microgrid, so through PV and so on, but also the demand side of things. So that was heating controls in um, in people's um, in homes. So by looking at you know when energy could be created, so with PV, it's obviously very sensitive. To the weather through actually generation of um, energy through the heating or district management systems which again many large um, residential housing blocks have through to adjusting people's behavior about and informing them when it was a good time to turn the heating off or on and also you know some great learning around actually how people did use their heating system when they did you know consume energy at different times of day and then that creates that feedback loop you know, within that district. So again, um, enabled ma to maximize the value from the renewable energies that are being created locally. Um, in the case of Greenwich, they had a water source um, heat recovery system from the Thames, which I think is, is, is a first worldwide. So again, another way of bringing in renewables into a local feedback loop. And again, you know, that's one thing that's becoming increasingly port important and also, in terms of engagement is having that loop between action and benefit to to residents and again something that is is almost completely data driven from you know the devices and sensors themselves through to contact points with with residents no thank you for that it's a good answer i mean i think one of the challenges going forward because one of the observations i've made historically is that we've had a tendency to work in silos. So the clean energy sector do their thing. Uh, the technology sector do their thing. The infrastructure guys do their thing. Construction sector, again, something else. But for this to work properly and for it to be a fully integrated approach, we actually need the decision makers from all of those different sectors committed and willing to stand up and make, make promises about working together and collaborating to try yeah. and while. Well, so, I mean, one last little point that there's one if there's one thing that the government could do in terms of you know reducing um energy consumption going forward it's building regulations so building regulations are nowhere near strong enough in terms of creating efficient homes with the vast increase in home building that's being driven at the moment for, for the right reasons you know the, the building regulations you know, for those homes, the energy efficiency that needs to be achieved, the use of electric vehicles, shared electric vehicles, you know, the, the policy is just far too weak. And, you know, we're missing a huge opportunity at the moment in terms of uh, what could be achieved. Which I think leads neatly as we've got five minutes left and I want to pose a question to all of you about what one thing do you think needs to change? make a real difference in this area whether it's policy as as jason suggested i'm sure he's got other ideas as to what else might make a more seismic impact but can i come to each of you and ask you the question if you could change one thing to facilitate what we're trying to do at the moment what would it be james can i come to you first absolutely thank you claire yeah i think um the biggest thing and the biggest takeaway for for us as an organisation has been those key common themes that we're seeing across, you know, London boroughs, across wider city councils, across the UK. Um, 
and I think um, it was touched on earlier in, in this webinar, that need to drive a better alignment so that there aren't multiple cities all trying out the same technologies, not sharing learning, not supporting each other to save time, save costs, you know, sharing best practices. For me, that that's the biggest um, biggest ask I have of the of the audience and 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 really of the local or regional government across the UK is just how do they better and how do we help support that better alignment um, so that there's not you know endless cycles of of piloting testing um, but rather collaborating, sharing best practice, and then seeing um, you know faster adoption and better um, well and ultimately cost savings for those organisations as a result. Thanks, James. Jason, do you want to supplement your policy answer with, with another? I'll give you the benefit of asking for two things. Well, I say two things. One is the technology exists to create smart cities, and it's been proven. So I think that's a learning that people need to take away. There's, there's still a tendency to go, we need to prove it in our city when the solution has been proved in, in many other cities. And you know, rather than going for a big, ambitious what we should do, I, I would build on what James is saying is, I think you know, as a group of peers, sort of leading cities and leading technology organizations, it's for us to come together in a peer-to-peer -to -peer manner and create you know, a movement, a group, I don't know what it is, to, to kind of lead the way and, and share our information. I mean, obviously, ideally, like it's happening in you know, lots of European countries. There's a huge amount of funding going into national programs of smart cities. That doesn't seem to be likely over here. So I think you know the best that we can do is is to work together to achieve that. Thank you, Bill. Can I come to you next, please? Yeah, my point's somewhat similar. There seems to be a bit of a theme on collaboration this morning. How do we make that become more effective? Um, I guess uh, my observation is that. Um, the notion of a city as a platform um, kind of feels quite compelling. So the city as an enabler, both from a technology and a governance sense, but not the city having to own every part of the technology, every technology decision, every policy element, but is the point of convening all these different uh, entities. Um, and I guess my observation is that cities need to take a lead, not in implementing everything, but in drawing together um, kind of uh, all those local groups and stakeholders. Thanks for that. Anna, from a public sector perspective, what do you think we need to do? Maybe you want to throw down the gauntlet to the private sector here. I think what has really struck me over the past six months is how we all behave when there is a real genuine emergency. Um, um, for example, in terms of transport, all the barriers that were there to us creating a more sustainable transport network are there now as they were six months ago, but we found ways of getting around them and of moving through them and of pushing on where we had to. Uh, and I think in terms of sustainability, in terms of decarbonising, and in terms of what this agenda can bring to decarbonisation, I think we need to act as though the climate really is the emergency. We've been calling it an emergency. We haven't been acting as though it's an emergency. We've now seen how fast all of us, public, private, everywhere, um, can work, how quickly our communities can mobilise. Um, if we want to get something done, when we saw COVID coming at us, Let's treat decarbonisation with the same level of urgency. Um, and if we all do that, I think uh, we've actually got a really good chance here. Couldn't agree more. And Gary, if I can come to you finally for, for a quick snapshot of your view, please. Yeah, quite, uh, from my perspective, quite straightforward. I think the, it's really the, the back end of the decision and deployment catching up with the vision. Uh, we still are massive. The vision is fantastic. I think everyone, I don't, I've never met anybody that disagrees with vision and actually what we're trying to achieve. The problem is, is that when you look at the deployment and the specification, it's 30 years old and, and it's really somebody's got to sort of chop that out and start at the vision not start 30 years ago and I think that's really the big fundamental shift that we need to see across really the, the whole economy. Thank you for that Gary. Everyone we have run out of time which I'm really sorry to say as I'd love to continue the discussion in wrapping up I'd like to thank you for your attention and for contributing to the debate this morning. Thank all of our panel members for their insights and observations. And finally, if you feel as passionately as we all do about the issues we've covered this morning and want to continue the debate, then please join us this afternoon at the second of our sessions entitled No More Pilots, where I'll be making a call to action for those in the audience who wish to be involved and see if we can help move the dial by less talking and more action. I hope to see you then. Thank you, everyone.
ok.